All right, guys, Bruce with Targeted Wealth Creation back at you here, uh, bringing you Defiance's monthly distribution. So they declare on the 30th. And let me give you some key dates. And by the way, if you haven't saw it, I uploaded, uh, if you're watching this because you saw it, I up, <laughs> I upload, yeah, I uploaded an interview I had uh, with Sylvia Jablonski, who is the CEO and CIO. She has both of those roles for Defiance ETFs. Lovely, lovely person, very authentic, uh, very easy to speak with, and has a great career uh, with some other fun companies, and they're really growing Defiance and uh, I think it's still in its early stages, but I like some of the things they're doing. Interesting. I learned a few additional tidbits and and uh, she shared some things. So in essence, for those of you that may know it and just looking to see what the numbers are, they're here. For others that are wondering about it, so most of these ETFs are really wrappers. And, and I asked Sylvia this sort of as a pointed question. It seems easy in a way to start, but when you're a startup, why do you use all these other companies? You have a sub-advisor to do your options. You have a trading desk sub-advisor. You have somebody who pays and distributes your dividends. Um, and on and on and on. And she talked a lot about that. She said, you know, the smaller funds, that's kind of what we have to do. The Black Rocks, the Pro Shares, the Vanguards are really large funds. Even when she was at Drexion, she talked about they had their own marketing department. But she was talking at the end about a, a marketing group that they have. So they have Defiance Holdings and they have Defiance uh, marketing and Jacob heads that up for them and then obviously Sylvia and the other people that work with her all handled the ETF portion. Um, so I, I thought it was a very um, good interview in that she departed a lot of information and at the same time I tried to ask as much as I could about the fund so that I could pass that back to you guys. So let me jump into it. So a couple of key things here. First off, they have, uh, this should say declaration date, and I'm not sure if I didn't scroll. Hang on, let me scroll over to that. Yeah, so declaration date. Here's the key thing. Sorry about that, guys. 7.30, right? So on Tuesday, 7.30, they declare, that's why I now have them, their ex-dividend, meaning on 7.31, they then trade without the dividend. So if you want the dividend, you have to buy on the trading day of 7.30, July 30th. They pay on the 2nd, which I believe is Friday correct. So you need to buy on Tuesday in the markets. You need to, uh, on Wednesday, they're trading without the dividend. And on Friday, they pay. Now, the other interesting thing is they've declared, most of you know that, that own the funds. But those of you that didn't, a lot of these high yields, and this is the QQY, the JEPI, J-E-P-Y, don't confuse it with J-E-P-I, another fund, another company, and I-W-M-Y. So this is their NASDAQ-oriented high-yield fund. Uh, this is their S&P-oriented high-yield fund, and this is their Russell 2000-oriented high-yield fund. Again, a lot of you know this, some don't. Um, what, and so remember this one for three is only in these, what, the, she had a name for them. I think she called, these are the lower yielding, more stable NAV. The issue up here, and it sometimes leads to the reverse splits, is they pay out a very high rate. Look at this, 71% yield, 55% yield, 88% yield. So when these things are doing well, they're paying 60, 70, 80%. Well, it's awful hard to sustain that without having some NAV erosion. 
And that's exactly what happens. And, you know, three years down the line, five years down, it's not like they plan for this. There's just a certain stock price that triggers the stock to do a one for three. They could have done a one for two, but this allows them a lot more runway before they might ever need to do that. So, uh, and I'll say this and Sylvia confirmed just as I had, uh, I've, I put out videos on NVIDIA's 10 for one. I put out a video on MSTR. Both of those are underlying for funds that are in yield max and other people have those funds as well. So Sylvia talked about that and I said, yeah, I just think of it as an accounting thing. It has nothing to do with anything else, right? If you, if you had, you know, 100 shares, then you're going to get 300 shares and the shares are going to, or you're going to get, sorry, in the reverse, you're going to get 33 and a third shares from if you had 100, but the value of the shares are going to be three times as high. So it's really an accounting only function. But a lot of people look at reverse splits as negative. And you can, you can say that the stock is declining, but... I always say, and Sylvia confirmed this in her view as well, how do you measure a high yielding dividend stock? Well, some people say, hey, I bought the stock at 20 and it's 13, so I lost $7, right? I lost 7 20ths, okay? So I lost 35% of my value. But what did you get in a yield, right? So if you yielded 70%, and you took a NAV loss of 35%, then you have a 35% gain, right? 70% yield, 35% NAV loss, 70 minus 35, the last I checked was 35. So you always have to look at total return. I know some people look at ROI only and say, well, how soon do I get it paid off? And, and that's one way of looking at it. The question becomes, when you pay it off, is it the same asset yielding the same payment as it was before? If that payment's gone down 60%, but they haven't split, then you're only getting the same yield potentially on you know, 40% of the value that you had before. It just depends on the NAV reduction. But total return to me seems like the way to do it. But I respect people doing it different ways and looking at it differently. Look, you know, we're all creatures of, of what we like. All right. So on these funds, let's dig into a little bit more. So QQY, right? The, um, the NASDAQ Orient one had a nice 71.5 yield in July. What I did here is through the months, I tried to do a simple, I called it, you know, gain loss difference. I could just put a little column here and say difference, but then I stretch everything out that way. So I decided to come underneath it. And all you're doing is comparing month to month, right? So when I look at April, I, I got an 85 cent payout in QQY. It yielded 66.3%. Obviously, you just take the the stock price on the declaration day or the day before, uh, I took it on the declaration date, and then I you know, multiplied the dividend by 12 and divided it by the stock price. And I'd say, well, that's what it's paying me back. If I bought it today, but I collected 12 of these payments, it's going to yield me. So yield's going to constantly be changing, right? And you see it month to month. Last month, it was 56.94, the yield. Then it was 66 right? Then it was 63. This, you know, the, uh, June was 52. Now we have a 71.5. And then I said, how about the payment itself? Well, look here at, at QQY. In June, it paid 65 cents. It now paid 83 cents. So that's 18 cents more on 65 cents. So it went up, the payment went up a whopping 26.9, you know, 27%. And the yield, same thing. I, I, I take 71, subtract 52, and then base it on 52. So it had a 36% increase 
and its yield over the previous month. So that's all it's doing. And the only other thing I did was since since I, did, I could have gone on, some of these go back 12, 13 months, and some you can see are new. And I just simply said, what's the payment average, right? With five months, I don't have to skew it and say, I only want the last three or something, you know, or the trending, but five month average is, is decent. And you see it. So the QQY is, is averaging 65%. And JEPI is averaging 49% and almost 90% on IWMY. And, and if you look, we've seen a trend moving to IWMY out of the NASDAQ 100 and out of the MAG-7, which is 35%, 34 35% of the S&P 500, they're moving more into the Russell, which is the IWMY, and more into the medium cap stocks, not the giant MAG-7. Uh, and I just refer to that. Sylvia had some interesting thoughts, too, as a rebalancing um, all right, so on SPY T, so what's the difference of these down here? Well, they've launched QQQQT, which is the same. It's the same fun family in the sense that it's using the Qs as it's underneath, it's underlying, okay? And the SPY T is using what JEPY is using, which is the S&P 500, the spider. And then... This is totally different. This is an oil, more of a commodity base. Look up USO, and it's like an oil index. I say index, but it's a basket of oil stocks, I think. And so they're using that fund. So if you're bullish on oil, you want to own a, a USOY. They also have, although it's not pay, it's not really an income fund, they have some leverage funds. They have some other quantum, hydrogen. So there are some other funds, but since they aren't in the category of income, I'm not showing them. I may go in and show them and update them as well in the future. So on the last five payments, you see everything. And then what I did here on SPY T, since SPY T has been doing it for five months, your first month of QQT, and we're sort of waiting. They have a, I forget what the symbol is, but they have a Russell, just like they have here. And they call these more, my word would be value, okay? This is high yield. Again, they have a different name for them, but the simple way to know them is high yield. Look at these yields, right? So they're the ones that people complain about a NAV erosion. But again, total return is what's the yield minus how much did the fund drop in NAV price? So down here, they're targeting around a 20%. And look what they've delivered, right? 20.0. Actually, their number was 20.05 on their sheet. But when I did the math, I got 20.04. So there may have been a rounding in here of the four. Um, I got 20% essentially, 19.99 on QQQT. So when their Russell comes out, um, that will be doing well. I, I think we got another 10% upside probably in the rebalancing over to the, to the Russell. But don't hold me to that. That's just one man's opinion. Um, anything can happen in these markets. Um, so I track this as well, right? So you can see that uh, USOY, USOY, whatever you want to call this, right, is, um, is doing well. And, you know, I, I think the only thing with oil, I'm kind of very bullish on oil over the next three to seven years. But I, if we get further signs of a recession and go into a recession, then I think oil, the demand for oil is going to go down a fair amount. But that's more of a, you know, three to five month issue 
if we don't have a soft landing, which I'm kind of leaning that we get signs of a recession. But again, anything can happen. I don't, you know, I don't know everything on that front. But that's if you ask me and you said you got to pick, are we going to go into a recession or not see a recession at all in the next year or two? I would say we're going to see a recession. So oil could pull back during that term. But it doesn't mean you might not want to own it till we, we get further evidence of that. Okay, guys, so that's what I got for you. You can read all this stuff here. Don't forget about the split. If you notice that, don't freak out. The last thing you want to do, I mean, you wouldn't be buying it to get the dividend. Uh, once you go 731, you're not going to get this month's dividend. But if you notice a big drop in price or an increase in price, then you're going to know it came from the one for three reverse split. Okay, guys, that's what I got for you. Again, Bruce with Targeted Wealth Creation. I'm not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. Have a great one. Bye for now.